Good evening and welcome to the last session of the Global Tipping Point Summit on Rethinking Parenting. This is the 21st session of the summit. We started with three pre-summit events. We had a youth forum, which was the third. Then we had the education summit, which started on the 20th of November and went on to the 13th of December. And then the current parenting summit from the 8th of January to the 31st today. A big thank you to several of you who've been attending very, very regularly. I am Dr. Kumia Svevaina. I am the founder director of the summit. I retired in 2016 as a head of the Department of English in the University of Mumbai. After retirement, I work mainly as an education futurist. I've been a literary critic, a storyteller, a TEDx speaker. And after retirement, I started thinking of doing something meaningful and changing the format of seminars. I will not go into the details because most of you have been attending very regularly, but we wanted to make this a project-based seminar in order to see visible change, not merely talk about it, but see the change. Those of you who have been attending regularly would know the brilliant speakers we've had. Those of you who've missed it could go onto our website and look at the sessions we've had beginning with the inaugural session by Sally Ann Sridhar and Dr. Sujata Sriram. We've had amazing sessions like those by Father Joe Pereira on addiction, nurturing love and compassion in children and making them understand their connectedness to the earth, nurturing creativity in children, cyber wellness, integral parenting, scars of shaming, awareness and teaching of social justice, which is a session today, which Professor Mark McLeod, a very dear friend and a brilliant scholar, a publisher, an award-winning writer, etc., etc., is going to lead today. And we've had also a very, very important session by our special guest speaker, Father Godfrey, on depression and anxiety in COVID and post-COVID times. So if you've missed anything, please go on to the past events section of the website and hear these recordings. The structure of this summit is very different from the normal summits and conferences we have. The speaker here speaks for about 25 minutes, but the speaker has been liaising with four change facilitators marked in blue in this diagram, who have been working with the speaker over months they had decided on a very interesting project to bring about change. This project is open to all our online viewers. So if you are interested, please go to our website and fill in the Google form and become the change that you wish to see in the world. A summit of this magnitude could not have been handled by me alone. And that goes without saying. I need to thank so many people, 108 people. I can't name them all, but I could begin by thanking the advisory board, comprising Dr. Firoza Godrej, Mr. Noshir Kurodi, Mr. Noshir Dadrala, Mr. Sanjay Rastogi, Dr. Shernas Kama, Mr. Yasji Tantra, Ms. Debika Chatterjee, Ms. Raki Chabria, and Ms. Fiona Reynolds. We have received support from Tata Trend, Tantra Tech, K Merck, Lumiere Business Solutions, Education World, Parent World, Penn Ultimate, Teachers Help Teachers, First Moms Club, and Wolves. The short video you viewed at the beginning of the program was prepared by Wolves. We have been extremely fortunate to receive support from luminaries like His Holiness the Dalai Lama. A day before the education summit began, we received this letter from His Holiness. I will read out only the first section of the letter, which says, I am pleased to know about the Global Tipping Point Summit and its focus on improving the present education system so that our younger generation can become more responsible citizens of the planet. 
We also received very encouraging support from the founder of the Isha Foundation, Sadhguru. Sadhguru, Sadhguru's team has sent us quotes by Sadhguru, encouraging us and telling us to go forward with the event. Uh, General Shokin Chauhan, recipient of five Presidential Distinguished Service Awards, also sent a very encouraging letter to us, as did Mr. Kersi Chowda, who is best known as an extremely effective psychiatrist. Uh, Shri M, who is known as a spiritual guide, social reformer, educationist, and a Padma Bhushan awardee. We have also received a lot of support from celebrities like Cyrus Brocha and Bama Nirani, both of whom did podcasts with me. Cyrus is known to the world as a TV anchor, theater personality, comedian, podcaster, and author, and Baman Irani as a theater and film actor, voice artist, and photographer. Dr. Miki Mehta, global leading holistic health guru, corporate life coach and founder of the Go Green program also supported us, as did Ms. Rajeshwari Lumba Swarup, motivational speaker, actor, singer, and author. Mr. Shyam Dava, who's known to the world as a brilliant choreographer, singer, performer, and an entertainment director, also supported the summit. We have been fortunate to have a very strong team of others, um, a design team which comprises Rhea Soman, Disha Upreti, Janavi Kulkarni, Rohan Signikar, the organizing team comprising Sharuk Vivaina, Dr. Nina Nair, Shalanta Mascarinis, Valerie Mendonca, Nagma Nair, Sheikh, Mustak Sheikh, Madhu Nair, Gautami Ambie, and Dipti Mazumdar. Our technical team has given us unerring support mm -hmm. all through. Great thanks to Pezan Charna, Ashish Kadam, Disha Poddar, and Neha Vatsala. And most importantly, we have also received a lot of encouragement and support from several schools. Activity High School, Euro School, Ahmedabad, Iroli, Chimney Hills, Bangalore, Thane, um, also, the Ram Nivas, uh, Ram Nivas School, just give me a moment, please. Ram Nivas Bajaj English School, Malad, Shri Shri Ravi Shankar Vidya Mandir, Borivli, Godrej Udiachal School, Vikroli, and 38 schools of the Vidyo High Group. So many, many thanks to all these schools for supporting us. I also owe thanks to my core committee, I have a brilliant core committee. They have been working for me tirelessly for 21 months now. A big thank you to Ms. Donna Reen. She has been available to me at all times, advising, critiquing, and working with me. Thank you very, very much, Donna. Also, Mr. Yazdi Tantra, Deepa Soman, Mr. Milan Soman, Mr. Ba uh, Glenn Concesio, and Mr. Bhavin Shah. Many thanks to all. Okay, uh, this is uh, uh, a summit coordinator and on behalf of the core committee, I'd li also like to add here that today being the last session of the entire summit, we wish to thank Dr. Kumi Vivaina uh, wholeheartedly for, uh, from the depths of our hearts because we've enjoyed working with her on this whole summit. We, uh, we want to also tell her that it is not about us. It has been her infectious, indefatigable zeal, grit, determination, and never say die attitude. And by never say die, I mean, I don't know if half of you all know that she has been doing the entire summit with a fractured knee from her bed. And... Uh, and we'd also, uh, and by and by that, I even would like to say that she's literally given an arm and a leg for this summit. So uh, I don't say this is the last session because we will be the action starts now. 
and i would like uh, all of us to be uh, work together for this change and with that thank you dr kumi once again from all of us here including the participants who have been enriched by these talks and uh, i invite kajal menon to uh, the co-founder of leher a child rights organis organization to anchor the show thank you very much dana thank you team hello thank you everyone thank you donna thank you kumi for those very kind words and hello to all the people who have tuned in from across the globe for i won't say the last but for the final session of this extremely relevant and fruitful summit on rethinking parenting uh, that we are going to start very soon um i must say that i am really delighted to play a very small part in this very big and ambitious initiative um which nudges one and all to embrace change to create the tipping point towards a just equitable and empathetic world i'm kajol menon from mumbai and in my long journey um spanning uh, many decades have played many roles from teaching to media to communications development and of course a passionate child rights practitioner i'm the co-founder of leher along with nicole rangel it's a child rights organization that focuses uh on how to build communities to act and work towards keeping children safe and protected uh leher's vision is a world where caring families alert communities as well as responsive governments come together to create a world that is safe for children and protected for them in fact in in many ways not unlike gtps leher believes in shared and collective responsibility as well as in the ripple effect in the past um several years leher has been working on a community led child protection initiative in the district of madhubani in um Uh, bihar a state of india and what we have learned from many months and years of um process documentation and change and inspiration from the community is that communities really if they are sensitized and organized if they are equipped with skills with knowledge and tools they can really play a very dynamic and key role as partners uh with the formal system of child protection in keeping children safe but while leher works at the grassroots in communities such as villages blocks and districts it also looks to build digital communities especially with young people and uh especially post covid i think all of us have learned to pivot and to adapt to this new reality and we are seeing that there is a huge mandate and we can really cause a great movement and a change movement within the community so with this uh, aim in mind i would like to share with you our most recent and exciting initiative called the minor project uh, on instagram the minor project is a public a uh, youth public dialogue initiative and it uh, basically focuses through questions uh, to help end violence against ch children through questions through conversations through exchange of 
ideas. What we hope to build is a digital community that cares for children and childhood everywhere. We are also really delighted to share with you that the minor project, uh, we had lots of collaborations from young people, from communities as diverse as artists, musicians, poets, actors, directors. And that gives it a richness and a vibrancy that no nonprofit can really bring. It's visually appealing, it's tonally light, it's a fresh take on things, which actually draws young people to these very complex questions that we would like to speak on. Minor Project is, uh, in fact, uh, the conversations on Minor Project are led by our mascot duo, Minor, who's a young child who represents all children, and Murli, very familiar to the Indian audience, uh, elephant, a caring elephant who sort of um, stands and represents for the behavior change that we seek in society. And between the two, together they lead conversations, they unpack complex issues of violence that we always have to hear, especially the teacher and the parent community. Bullying, online abuse, child sexual abuse, corporal punishment, and they unpack these issues in a fashion which is not didactic, not preachy, and they draw the audience, especially a young audience to it, through their illustrations, to their music and all of that. So I would really, really request and urge, you know, all the people who have tuned in to this summit that whenever they get the time, they should head on to the minor project and join in the conversation to end violence against children because, um, and also to check out many of the wonderful resources that have been created. I especially in fact like uh, the seven part series called, uh, uh, you know, the art of nonviolent discipline. Obviously I think, you know, the time is up and I'm going to put the link up on the chat for everyone to see. But before that, delighted, delighted, very delighted to introduce the very accomplished Dr. Mark McLeod, teacher, uh, sorry, poet, academic, publisher, researcher. Uh, Dr. Mark McLeod is uh, going to speak on the awareness and involvement of children in social justice issues. I'm going to read out a little bit on Dr. Mark McLeod, who is the adjunct senior lecturer at Charles Sturt University in Wagga Wagga, Australia, and on the board of management at TAS Writers, Hobart, Tasmania. He's taught children's literature, Australian literature, creative writing at the United States, India, and in other places around the globe. He's the president and publishing director of Dirt Lane Press in partnership with publisher and editorial director, Margaret Lemond, where his publishing career focuses on narrative texts at agents of change. I think this is a very, very important part and I'm sure he's going to speak on it. He's been the publishing director at Random House, publisher at Hatchet Australia, freelance editor for publishers, including University of Queensland Press, Omnibus Books, ABC Books, and Queer Inc. India. Mark is also well known for his TV commentary on books for young readers on television, radio, and in print media. His current research interests are in LGBTIQ narrative for young people, the awareness and teaching of social justice and the adaptation of children's texts. A former national president of the Children's Book Council of Australia, Mark has won numerous awards for distinguished service to children's literature and for titles published under his own name, Mark McLeod Books. For many years, he has been executive direct editor of the journal International Research in Children's Literature, published by Edinburgh University and is author of poems for adults and children and picture books for children. 
delighted to make Dr. Mark's introduction and really, really looking forward to enjoying and his session and his sharing. Over to you, Mark. Namaste, Dosto. How are you? Thank you, Dr. Kumi. Thank you, Kajul. Um, it was, it's a great honor to be asked by Dr. Kumi to help change the world. Uh, <laughs> she always reserves the, the biggest challenges for her close friends. When Dr. Kumi suggested that, I thought to myself, I don't have the skills to do this. I can't go to a village and help build houses and I can't hook up plumbing. Um, I'm not a lawmaker. I'm not an education policymaker. So at first I thought, I can't help anyone change the world. I've devoted my life to studying the ways that human beings tell stories and to helping them tell stories more effectively and to helping them understand when other people tell stories. And then I realized that we do that all the time. And without it, there would be no house builders and there'd be no food growing and there'd be no policy making. We have the power to write a new story in the future. We can also rewrite the past. Uh, now, I'm not talking about Donald Trump's alternative facts. We can't change the facts of births and marriages, jobs and death and moving houses and so on. But we can change the ways that we regard them. We can change our attitudes, our interpretation of the facts of our lives. I'm speaking to you tonight from um, beautiful Munina country. Um, the Munina people, it's about as far south in Australia as you can get. Uh, when I get my screen, oh, I'm sorry. We had this before. Why isn't it? Ah, oh, yeah, there we are. Sorry. Doesn't matter how many times you rehearse, it still goes wrong on the night. Okay. Mark, we okay. can't see your yes, screen. Yes, no, it's fine. Sorry. Yep. Uh, we can't right. see your screen. Okay, now it's fine. Now it's Okay, fine. great. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry for the delay. Um, so I'm speaking to you from the beautiful country of the Moonina people. It's about as far south in Australia as you can go. And the next stop is Antarctica. Every day, I look out my front door to the mountain that when I was growing up was called Mount Wellington, but we're gradually reclaiming the Aboriginal names. And we love the name for this mountain, which is Kunangi. It overlooks the city that you know as Hobart, but which in the coming years will be renamed Nipaluna. 15 minutes to the north are rainforests and beautiful pure waterways. Um, 25 minutes to the south, I can look out over the whole of the city from Kunangi. Those name changes are part of the rewriting of the story of my home. You know, I love the word India and I like the word um, Hindustan, but I really wish the world knew you by your Hindi name, Bharat. It's a beautiful word. To me, it sounds like the purr of a friendly tiger. The project of this final session in the summit is to invite you to write part of the story of your life. Not the whole story, but an episode in it, focusing on the way that you turned what looked like a disadvantage into an opportunity for change. What skills did you discover as you went on that journey? What surprises were there along the way? I'm working with four highly skilled and supportive mentors, friends, colleagues, who will gently help you to rewrite the story of your life and help you inspire others to do the same. Because at the end of the year, We'll publish your stories online as an anthology of next chapters in the story of your life. The United Nations tells us that in 2020, 79.5 million people were forced to leave home. 26 million refugees, around half of them under 18 years old. The mass migration, which we're, are we, no, we, we, we get so used to hearing statistics, they kind of just wash over us and, and we feel we're kind of grasping at them, trying to understand, trying to get a hold on them. 
it started with the Industrial Revolution and it just kept going. Um, the why? Because as we traveled, we became aware of inequity. Uh, so the restless searching of human beings was for social justice. So 79.5 million people, an unprecedented number of people searching. Um, and what are they searching for? They're searching for home. Think of it. But where is home? What is home? We often have mixed feelings about the word and what it represents. In the death of the hired man, um, Robert Frost's character says, home is the place where when you have to go there, they have to take you in. Habitat for Humanity says, home is a safe haven. It's a place of comfort, a place where you, a place to live with our families and pets and enjoy with friends, a place to build memories, as well as a way to build future wealth, a place where we can truly just be ourselves. So the search for home is a literal search with tragic risks and consequences sometimes, but we know it's also an emotional, a psychological and a spiritual search. So in that light, there are not just millions, but there are billions of people searching for equity today, searching for a haven, a social justice place, a place of support. I've been lucky enough to live through one of the biggest waves of change in human history, the second and third and fourth waves of feminism, when women claimed the right to tell their story, which of course was an infinite number of stories, and yet at the same time, the one story. One of the crucial tools for second wave feminism was language. Um, the head of the company in the 1960s and 70s was the chairman. Well, it usually was a man. That was part of the patriarchy that told a story in which women were hardly even mentioned. Uh, it resulted in some games with language. You know, people said at the time in the 70s, well, look at the way that uh, men have dominated history. It's called history because it's his story. And so there was a kind of playful changing of the word to her story, completely wrong. Um, as far as the history of the language goes, it had absolutely nothing to do with him and her, but it made a good point. Uh, then there was the fight for LGBTIQ rights, a fight that's still ongoing. Um, so complex that we had to keep adding letters of the alphabet if we were going to include all those people who felt excluded previously. The fight for the rights of people who were differently abled, physically, emotionally, intellectually, not disabled, differently abled. Religious and political intolerance, the worsening inequity of wealth, the ongoing search for equal access to food and water and clean air and medical help. All these movements generated by people who'd been written out of the story of what was supposed to be their community, all searching restlessly for the safe haven that if human opportunities were equal, they would deserve and they would get. So this searching I'm talking about is literal, but it's also metaphorical. They're looking for the perfect story arc for their lives. And that's one of the reasons, of course, why this year long lockdown has been so deeply resented by us. That lockdown stopped us looking for the elusive home that we believe was there if we could just keep moving, keep going on our journey and we would find it. You might be wondering why I seem to have left out perhaps the dominant and the most painful of these movements. I said before that we have complex feelings about home. We got hooked on searching. I know that when somebody calls me and asks me if I'm going to be home for a while today because they want to drop by and I say, yes, I'll be at home all morning. The second I put the phone down, I want to go somewhere. I want to go out and I resent having promised that I'd stay put. So it's, very, it's almost innate to us, this, um, this drive to keep looking, to keep searching. The reason that I've left this one, which has been so dominant and so painful, so tragic um, over the past year and well, for my whole lifetime, 
is that it's a search that includes all the other searches I've referred to. And that's a search for racial equality, racial equity. And the reason is that it's touched my family deeply. Several generations ago, my family came from Jamaica. And in the Australia at the time, my mother felt that her dark skin was a total curse. She had a tough life. Um, <laughs> my sister had a tough life too, tough childhood. I ended up with more of my father's uh, pale English skin colouring. Am I calling that lucky? I don't know. I was spared the tears that they shed throughout my life at least. But here's the ironic thing about being forced out from home. If you, if you are forced out of home, it does give you some degree of freedom to define the kind of home that you want to find. I grew up to be the parent of two biological children and one adopted child whose skin is a beautiful, intensely dark color. His birth mother wasn't able to keep him because her family was ashamed that she had had him outside marriage. I knew that we could help him with what would be a lifelong journey towards acceptance. And you know, some days I think that we're failing completely and some days I think that we've made some little advances. And it's a process that will continue as long as each of us lives. He was forced out of home as a new baby. Um, children, when anyone who's got contact with small children knows that when the house goes quiet, there's usually something wrong. They're up to something. And I remember when he was just a toddler and the house went suddenly quiet and I thought, where is Luke? And I went looking through the house and he was in the bathroom. There was, there was a tap running and I quietly peeped around the door and I said, what are you up to? And he turned over his shoulder and said to me, I'm trying to get this dark stuff off my hands. Um, in a new book, Uju Asika, Bringing Up Race, How to Raise a Kind Child in a Prejudiced World, Asika tells us stories about the ways that she helped her own children to withstand race prejudice. You don't need, to, need me to tell you about the unspeakable violence done to people in our world because they're from a different race. But Asika talks about a phenomenon that's more familiar to middle-class families, and that's what she calls microaggressions. It starts for her with the observation that her children have slightly different skin color from her own. Uh, so right from the birth of her children, she is asked by friends and people she meets, where did you get that baby? Where did you get it? Her advice is patience and understanding of the fear that lies behind those questions. But I kind of privately cheered for her when she's exhausted by the question, where did you get that baby? And she answers, out of my vagina. Asika's book is full of practical advice on how to help children write a new story about being of a different race. And children watch us, children study adults. You know, this is the thing. People wonder why language matters so much. Any, any child who's called Tim usually knows exactly what is coming up when a parent says, Timothy, um, it's not going to be good. And children study us 24-7. They notice little differences. And these are the kinds of microaggressions. So when we say... Um, oh, you know, just don't take any notice of that. Of course they take notice. And Asika talks about the kinds of microaggressions that anyone with um, deep coloured skin has noticed when, let's say, um, they're walking in the street and they come against somebody who, from their position of white privilege, just suddenly feels subtly for their wallet in their pocket. Um, it's a microaggression. Somebody clutches their uh, shoulder bag a little bit more tightly when they see somebody from a different skin color. That's what she's talking about. First, she says, when she's giving us the advice on how to deal with this, first she says, you have to give it a name. You have to turn around and face what the issue is in your life or in the child's life. Scholars of children's literature remind us that in the fairy tale Rumpelstiltskin, 
the bad fairy loses his power completely when the miller's daughter finally learns his name. You remember that she is given the challenge to spin straw into gold and the Rumpelstiltskin, the bad fairy, tells her that he will help her do this um, if she guesses his name. Well, she has three goes at guessing it and she finally learns his name and she says it. That is the point when she tells him his name. He's so furious that he stamps a hole in the floor and disappears. As a kid, I loved that scene. I thought it was fantastic. So I'm hoping to inspire you with a few examples from children's literature tonight, not because I want you to write stories for children, but because that's what I know best. And in 20 minutes, I can't even come close to the kind of support that our team of mentors can give you when you sign up to write a memoir from your own life. But I can take a few examples from children's books that I love that are truthful about the ways that they confront challenges. So turn around, face the problem, watch and listen and notice the details. A very beautiful book um, called When Stars Are Scattered is by Victoria Jameson and Omar Muhammad. And it's based on Omar Muhammad's real life experience. It tells the story of two Somali boys ripped from their home by war and poverty and the last thing the older boy Omar remembers is promising his mother that he will look after his younger brother Hassan for the rest of his life. Hassan is blessed with an emotional and intellectual difference that will make life by himself in this society a real struggle. Omar is offered the opportunity of a really great education by a, a, a sponsor, a mentor who notices his talent and offers to help him. And this seems like the best chance that Omar has to take him and his brother to the United States, where he hopes that he can find a better story for the next chapter of his life. But to get that education, he's going to have to leave his brother at home all day, and he just can't do it. The story is an honest and uplifting account of the lives in a refugee camp, and the story is in great detail. So face the issue, give it a name. Um, Watch and listen, notice the details, then read the silence. Sometimes the most important parts of a story are unspoken. Pat Hutchins's book, The Doorbell Rang, is a really good example of this. It was published in 1986. A generation of immigrants after World War II from Africa, the Caribbean, um, South Asia and so on, made the UK a multiracial society of a kind that many British people had never known. In the doorbell rang, Ma has made some cookies. Um, she's made a batch of them and her two children count them, of course, um, and there are 12. So that means six cookies each. Then the doorbell rings and in come two friends. Good, says Ma, you can share the cookies. That means the children calculate, that's four children, that's three cookies each. Then the doorbell rings and more children arrive. Ah, uh, it's down to two cookies each. Then the doorbell rings and more children arrive and it's down to one cookie each. At this point, it's really significant that the new children have black skin and different hair from the children who are already in the house. Now look at the black and white floor. It's never mentioned in the words in this story, but now the crowd of children is black and white, like the floor. And Ma is throughout the story mopping. She's got a bucket and a mop because it keep, it's constantly covered with dirty footprints. So here's, here's a story in which there's something going on that is extremely important, but it's not really mentioned in the words. The doorbell rings again and rings again, and no one moves because there are no more cookies to go around. There's a silence. And finally, they have the answer and they open the door and it's grandma who's made a batch of cookies, so she saves the day. That black and white floor and the mopping of the dirty footprints is what we call the subtext in the story. It's definitely part of the story, but you might not think so at first because it isn't referred to explicitly. As you face whatever issue it is that seems to have dominated your life, and I'm using your life because 
by extension, you can consider the children that you live with or work with and whatever it might be that is part of the story of their lives. As you face whatever that issue is that seems to have dominated your life and you want to write about it, you need to ask the question, is that the whole of the story of my life or is it just part of the story? There are many, many stories about an issue that India has been grappling with for recent years, like the rest of us, and that is the exclusion of some people because of their sexuality. And we could talk about books for children in which that is the whole story. But in this one, Love Makes a Family by Sophie Beer, we see an example of a book in which it's just part of the story. The story is very complex, even though it's for very young children and it's visually complex. Some parents and some schools in both your country and mine have prevented children from reading stories in which a child had same-sex parents, books such as Heather Has Two Mummies, a very early one. But in this one, Love Makes a Family, there's such a lot going on in the pictures that the question of whether the parents are same sex is actually incidental. It hardly matters. It's just part of the story. On the final page of the book, it says the words say simply, love is a kiss before bed. Good night. There are bright colours. There are lots of details. There's mobiles and artworks on the walls. There's a dog on the bed. There's a toy being clutched. And the two adults are probably though not definitely women, just friends maybe, um, maybe a mother and an auntie or same-sex parents. Individual children reading this book will make up the story for themselves. And that's what happens in contemporary stories. Children are empowered to be the agents of the understanding of their own stories. It all comes down to what Alexander and Sundahl, the authors of The Danish Way of Parenting, call reframing the question. They point out that Danish people in popular surveys over the past 40 years have been consistently voted the world's happiest people. And the authors, authors suggest that one of the reasons is that Danish parents are particularly skilled at reframing the question rather than tell children that they're good or bad or that they've failed at some task or other, Danish parents see growth as an ongoing process and challenge their children to find ways of doing things differently when they come up against what seems like a roadblock. So instead of marching down to the school to complain about their child being bullied, instead of encouraging the child to take revenge on the bully, Danish parents will lead their children gently in discussion to reframe the question. In one example in the book, the conversation results in the child deciding to go to school the next day and try to make the bully their friend. When I was younger, second wave feminism, as I said before, inverted the stories told to children. So a story about a fireman became a story Brenda the fire chief. Stories about boys gangs became stories about girls gangs. Male oriented fairy tales were rewritten, feminized as female oriented stories. Counter-sexism is the term that was used for it. It grabbed our attention and therefore it made useful political points. But folks, it was still sexism. We hadn't advanced at all towards an acceptance of equity um, between the sexes and genders. In the same way that a story when, where some characters just happen to have a different faith or appearance and some parents just happen to have a different sexuality. So by reframing the question, we can challenge prejudice and help children to ease our society towards a greater future sense of social justice. Are children innately prejudiced? Where does prejudice come from? I well remember the day when I was driving my three children somewhere and I asked my youngest daughter as we were driving along, what do you want to be when you grow up? She was four or five and she thought and she said, I think I'd like to be a nurse. I said, like a good student of second wave feminism or a doctor, instantly in the back seat of the car, a fight broke out. Her older brother and sister yelled, she cannot be a doctor, she's a girl. Where did that come from? Where did that come from? The same children, Luke, when he was just a toddler and he had several other boys who he was friendly with in the street, and I'm standing on the porch and I see these kids walking along arm in arm, these big tough boys, um, yelling out, more boys, no sissy girls, more boys, no sissy girls. 
I thought to myself, what am I going to do? Am I going to call them on this or am I going to let it go because, you know, don't make a big deal about it? I thought, no, blow it. I'm going to, I'm going to call them on this. I said, Luke, come here. Um, I said, you know, that's not a really good thing to be calling out because your sisters are girls. They are not girls. Now, why would Luke say that? He had a sister who was older, a sister who was younger. And I said, your sisters are girls. They are not girls. That's really weird. So the word girls had a sort of force in his life. And where did that come from? It did not come from the house. It did not come from the family. And on the score of whether Halcyon could be a doctor or not, um, where did that come from? Because those children never had anything but a woman doctor and a woman dentist. Where it comes from is European binary thinking. We spend so much time in early stories for children, teaching them opposites, day, night, right, wrong, black, white, high, low, fat, thin, and so on. What we forget to do later on is to talk about those strange transitional stages in between. Frankly, I think that the, the transition between day and night is a way more interesting time, visually and every other way, than full-on day or full-on night is. Reframing the question, I think, is best done with a sense of humour. My Afghan refugee family, friends who came to live in a traditionally conservative inland Australian community, helped to change it forever. When they invited me over early on for a traditional Afghan family meal, I jokingly said when they brought out a huge plate of chips or French fries, chips? Yes, said the mother with a huge grin, Afghan national food. Reframing the question. Um, on their first Christmas, I knew that they were devout Muslims. I said to them, you know, the, the local welcoming committee would buy every new family a Christmas tree. And I said very tentatively, would it be all right if we gave you a Christmas tree from the city for your new home? And the father just looked me straight in the eye and said, why would we want to reject anything that would increase the happiness in the world? Why would we reject anything? that would increase the happiness in the world. Again, reframing the question. One of the sayings of my own faith community that I love best is, consider the possibility that you may be wrong. You know, today we're all so busy being outraged at everything on social media, nine faces yelling at the screen on Fox News, which Indian students tell me is not Indian at all. It's imported from the United States. We don't take the time to observe and to listen and to learn. We surround ourselves with what we now call echo chambers in social media. We only listen to and we only read and we only watch the things we agree with. We don't give ourselves a chance to consider difference. I love this picture book by the Australian team Bet and Beck and Matt Stanton. Look at the starburst on the cover. It, the book is called This Is A Ball. And the starburst on the cover says, book, books that drive kids crazy. Or should it be books that drive adults crazy? Either way, each illustration is a playful dialogue about the meaning of a word. This is a dog, this page says. Nah, it's a dog for sure. I can see its eye, its legs, it must be a dog. On the opposite page, of course, is the picture of an elephant. Then later in the book, this is a scary monster. What do you mean? You think this is the princess? I think you're a bit confused. Children love to um, apportion roles when you read this book with them. Uh, and sometimes they'll take the big print for themselves and sometimes they'll give it to you as the adult caregiver. Children love to um, play around with it all the time using language and humour to reframe the story. So the role of humour and surprise in reframing a story is powerful. Ask yourself when you come to write your story, ask yourself genuine questions, real questions. Take yourself on a journey of discovery into your life, not just the reader. You, you need to, as Robert Frost said, as you explore, be willing to encounter the surprises that it might uh, reveal for you. No surprise for the writer, said Frost, no surprise for the reader. In Kartik and Roy's picture book, A Walk with Tambi, which is one of my favourite Indian picture books, the narrator tells us about the nice walk that he's been told to take with Tambi. They enjoy the bazaar, 
They love the trees. They love the water. They even get covered in mud when they play. They enjoy it so much that they're not watching the clock and the narrator realises that they're way past their curfew. When they get home, they're totally busted. But when Amma sees what a great time they've had and she says on the last page, and you've had fun too, haven't you? Tambi wasn't the dog after all. He was the boy. And he was being taken for a walk by the narrator. The narrator was the dog because Tambi is living with impaired vision. Well, a surprise like that at the end of the story sends us right back to the beginning. A perspective and looked at it in a different way, the end of any story is a beginning. And that's a perspective that people from your country know far better than people from mine. So I hope when you sign up to work with these wonderful writers that you're going to hear from in a moment, I hope that you will feel courage in retelling some aspect of your life um, so that it will inspire the young people that you live with, the young people you work with. Instead of directly teaching them, your example will be what they follow. Uh, so much research on how children read new books comes down to children, when we, when we recommend books as adults, as teachers and librarians, that's about halfway down the list of the reasons that children will, will read a book. The reasons children often cite for reading a book is number one, their best friend read it and enjoyed it. And number two, they witnessed somebody else picking the book up and enjoying it. Um, and remember that one, one of the best things that anyone ever said to me about a book is, a book never asks you why you need to know. Thank Thank you, Mark, for that engaging and very inspirational talk. There are quite a few questions which have come in and once the change facilitators finish their bit, uh, we will address those questions. The change facilitators for this program that Mark is doing have been working with him for several months now and they've come up with a very, very interesting idea of tackling the whole concept of home. Um, How to Get Home is the title of the project. And if you are interested in it, kindly sign up the Google form and join the action group, which is available on our website, www.gtpsforchange.org. The change facilitators today are Dr. Sachin Labde. Dr. Sachin Labde is an associate professor in the Department of English, University of Mumbai in India. His research interests include English language pedagogy, queer studies, South Asian Englishes, and contact language. Besides, he's passionately involved in various projects of social development. Welcome, Sachin. The next change facilitator is Gauri Suresh. Gauri has done her MA in English, where she obtained the first rank. She is a passionate educator with experience teaching from the sixth grade to final year bachelors. She's an enthusiastic researcher working independently with special interests in surveillance studies, gender and queer studies. Welcome, Gauri. The third facilitator in the team is Rohit Day from Sikkim. Rohit is a research student in the Department of English at Sikkim University. Presently, he's pursuing an MPhil in English from Sikkim University. His main interests are writing stories and poems, reading stories and conversing with people at a deeper level where he can attempt an understanding their sentiments, thoughts and life stories. Thank you, Rohit, for being with us. The last change facilitator is from Australia, Dr. Ruth Backus. Dr. Ruth Backus convenes courses on literature, creative writing and politics in the School of Humanities and Social Sciences, Charles Short University in Australia, based at its campus in Bathurst, New South Wales. 
She has a keen interest in and love for India and has visited more than 10 times, spending most of the time in Tamil Nadu. Welcome, Dr. Ruth, as well. With this, I hand over the session to the first change facilitator, Sachin Labde. Over to you, Sachin. Yes, I think I'm able now. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Kumi, for this very generous introduction. And uh, this, I'll just continue with what Professor McLeod has said. The psychologist Howard Gardner wrote in his book, Changing Minds, that to capture the attention of a disparate population story, embedding that story in one's own life, and presenting the story in many different formats so that it can eventually topple the counter stories in one's culture. Yes, stories can and do shape culture in positive or negative ways. Stories help shape our views of the world and people around us. Stories help us get perspectives. Stories serve to create new role models. So what story? A story of your coming home to yourself, a story of standing up what you are for what you are, what you think you are, while others treat you as the other and different. A story of your ups when things seem down. A story of things seem wrong. A story of perspirations. Story. Your story may give voice and courage to those young minds struggling to pause for a while and read what really what reality they assume about you, be it parents, teachers, neighbors, acquaintances, or passerbys. So what is our role here? We are here to train you in telling your story. If you have an idea, we will help you shape it. If you are struggling with silence, we'll help you break it. So bring your stories to us. We will share ideas about a number of ways we can or you can bring your story to, the, to life. And while we do this, we promise that we do respect your feelings. What needs to remain between us will remain between us. So if you think that you have a story to tell that can help people, especially parents, nurturing a non-judgmental, sensitive, considerate outlook among children, then sign up to join this action group. Thank you. And now over to you, Gauri. Thank you so much, uh, sir. I'm just sharing my screen. So before I start up on my focus for this project, I'd just like to connect back to uh, children's literature and how Mark Sir uh, spoke about how they're able to help us change our perspectives and even sometimes change the narrative itself. So young adult fiction as an extension of children's literature helps us do the same thing. Um, for example, if you consider Rick Ryden's Percy Jackson series, you have characters who are different in the sense some of them have learning disabilities. Most of them are from broken homes and ethnic minorities, and some of them are queer. So these kids, they don't just find a home at Camp Hawkblood and Camp Jupiter, but they're able to turn their disabilities into strengths. And eventually they go ahead and save the world multiple times. For example, if you take the character of Nico D'Angelo, um, in one of the missions where they have to uh, save the world, he is confronted by Cupid, who forces him to reveal his deepest secret of the fact that he's gay. And when that happens, instead of discriminating against him or othering him in any way, his friends are there to comfort him and support him. And eventually, when he chooses on his own to come out to everyone else, he's accepted and supported. And everyone just continues to include him 
in their lives and they continue to love and care for him throughout. So the fandom of the Percy Jackson series, which is basically a community of teens and young adults, they also love uh, Nico and they think that Nico and his partner are like the cutest couples uh, in Camp Jupiter and Camp Half-Blood. And by extension, these communities have now become spaces where queer fans of the series are able to come out and find acceptance and support among the other fans. And through my uh, membership in these communities and as a teacher, my interactions with my young adult students has shown me how much these stories, especially of Nico, have been able to have a very strong impact on the understanding that these kids have about the world. And I can see how this new generation is more accepting and supporting. And I feel that there is hope uh, at a more inclusive society through such stories. So my focus in Maxwell's project is going to be the queer community and stories about how individuals have been able to find home by such things as relocating physically or changing their names and pronouns or altering the body or generally doing anything that allows them to feel a sense of acceptance and belonging, especially something that makes them feel at home with themselves and with those around them. So these are the stories that I will be looking for. And the hope is that through these stories, we can spread the message that we don't need to bleach our rainbows to fit in among dull clouds. We can just go ahead and find a more accepting sky. Thank you. And with that, uh, I invite Rohit to speak about his project. Yes, am I audible? Yes. OK, OK. Thank you. So uh, basically, we are engaged in this uh, project, how to get home. And uh, the basic, our main aim is to get stories, any type of stories. I'm interested in any type of story, any type of story. And um, if uh, if I if I move to my slides, do I have my slides displayed? Okay. Anyway. Anyway, so uh, basically, uh, we are uh, we are interested in in stories of stories of hope. Stories. Uh, the M Mark had a point in his uh, presentation that home is a safe haven and a comfort zone. So what is so this is the basic definition of home. How people who struggled with their life struggled struggled with their lives. How did they get home? How did they got to a safe haven? How did they get to their Comfort zone. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so if I move to my third slide, if I move to my third slide, yeah. So if you, you can see that Popeye is uh, taking his spinach. So yeah, we are interested in your stories, which we want to know your spinach. What got you the muscles and uh, and the muscles roll, you begin to roll your muscles and show off. Like, how did you get your home and how did you find an easy time with yourself? We want to know what was your spinach and we want to show that to the world. This is what we are basically interested in this project of how to get home and th all thanks to Mark for getting us engaged in this. And uh, the next slide uh, is we, we it's uh, very much over there that we engage with people and motivate them to write about how they got home, which I said, the spinach, we're interested in the spinach, the story of the spinach. And um, we as change facilitators are engaged in fashioning that story, making it more presentable. And there are some challenges, of course, challenges will come. And uh, more than being a writer, we have, we have to have more interpersonal skills. I felt that there, there were some problems which crept in, like I do not have time, I do not have this or that, but then we have to engage with the writers that how can we move forward together without putting any pressure, but, but bringing out that story anyhow, which we want anyhow, this story, we're interested in the, knowing the story of the spinach. Yeah, and to the next slide, uh, the stories and uh, the stories shared in our project will help those who are also in quest of home. That, that, is, that is why we are doing this. That is why we are engaged in this project. And uh, finally, I will end, end, this, uh, end this talk with, by the uh, last slide where 
there is a quote from Vanessa Boris, a psychologist, professional storyteller, and an executive coach who writes in her article, which is available online, what makes storytelling so effective for learning. She says that good stories do more than create a sense of connection. They build familiarity and trust and allow the listener to enter the story where they are, making them more open to learning and stories are more engaging than a dry recitation of data points or a discussion of abstract ideas. So yeah, the readers, when the readers, when they engage with your stories by reading them, they, they relate with you. They, they get themselves into the stories, identify with you, take answers from you. So that's why we, are, we want to work with more and more stories and we invite more and more people to the project so that we can work with you and bring out more stories from this project, How to Get Home. Thank you. I would like to end my talk over here. Hi, everybody. Can you hear and see me? You can hear me? Yes. Thank you. Um, I can have my um, slides up now too, please, if that's okay, Glenn, thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, we can whip on through. So I was very pleased when uh, Mark asked me to be involved in this. I was thrilled. Um, Mark and I share a love of children's literature um, and India. Um, and I think also um, we're both convinced of the power of stories to change the world and also the power of um, enabling people to tell their personal stories. Um, I can flip to the next slide or the, even the one after, I think, Glenn, thanks. Um, I gathered, yes, probably the one after. I gathered together a um, group of writers already, um, and that was probably because I've been lucky enough to teach some creative writing subjects. I asked people who'd enjoyed those subjects. Some of them have actually formed a writing group after the official session is over because they just wanted um, to keep writing with each other and keep going. Um, we got together, someone said, let's have a meeting and we had a Zoom and I thought I would talk quickly about some of the things that came out of that. I can go to the next slide. Um, yes, I think um, it is important to say, I've um, asked them to write about their own journey in their own way. Um, and I know each one will bring their own perspective to the writing. They were a very, they are a different group of people. They're from um, different cultures in a way, cultural backgrounds, um, also different age groups. I thought I'd talk about the Zoom meeting because it would be interesting to anyone who wants to encourage other people to tell their story, express their creativity. Um, but also perhaps if you're thinking of signing up, some of the things that um, my group had concerns about you may also and I may be able to kind of allay some of those concerns. Um, so the first one was that the writers were worried about, you know, is what I going to do, uh, what I want to do going to be close enough to the project guidelines and certainly, you know, I did encourage them to keep the guidelines in mind, um, you know, that it should be about some way of finding your way home, but they didn't have to interpret them too rigidly. The guidelines are not straitjackets. Um, and that, you know, tell your story in your voice um, and that will make your work much richer and much more interesting to other people. Um, the other three, I could go to my next slide, they're connected, but I'll tease them out a bit. Um, so there was that anxiety about who exactly would be reading it. I think um, Mark has probably allayed that already. It'll be on the summit site um, and nowhere else. And also I'd mentioned that they could use a nom de plume or a hand name to protect their privacy if they wanted to. Um, they were some were anxious about just making that some one of them's already done some or two of them have actually already done some publishing um, 
one with me and one on her own, um, or had some work published. But they were concerned about making that huge leap of just putting their story, their personal story, out into the world. Um, and as uh, Rohit, I think, said, certainly, you know, maybe uh, what comes between us will be shared between us and won't go out anywhere else. But putting your personal story out into the world, being published is a big thing rather than writing just for me. And some of those people as students had written very personal things they didn't want to share. Um, I encouraged them to be as brave, you know, to bring as much courage to it as they could, but, you know, only to write what they felt comfortable in sharing obviously, you know, the balance, they would have to find the balance um, around what they were willing to share with a much broader readership. Um, the last one, and it's really quite closely related to that whole issue of being published, is just to do with whether the writing will be good enough at all. Um, and here the group talk was great. Uh, I mean, we all talked about our fears around being good enough which I think uh, most human beings have some kind of fear like that. Um, and they were wonderful. Um, we could go to the next slide. This, the group were really wonderful in the sense that they all came in and really um, reassured and encouraged each other, um, which was so pleasing to me. One of them, um, who's a Wiradjuri or Dharawal um, woman, uh, which is an Indigenous person of this area, um, said to another person who was worried about sharing her work, um, something about you tells me whatever you write will be very powerful. Um, and I think that second woman went away just feeling, yeah, I'll be fine, I'll do it. Um, and I've already had a great draft from um, the Indigenous woman. So I think the writer, that group of writers all enjoyed meeting and writing. I think they came away feeling more confident, ready to start writing. Um, so we'll see what happens next for the next part of the story. But if you're thinking of signing up, um, I think it would be a wonderful thing to do. So go for it. Thank you. Thank you to Mark, as well as all the change facilitators. It was completely wonderful to see how stories could be used to share personal spaces, spaces of acceptance, to find spaces of acceptance and, you know, stories, as Mark mentioned, about change in narratives, about the subtext, the non-word um, or non-verbal uh, ones, the visual capacity of stories, and then the project by the facilitators of how to get home. I think uh, a lot of young people in the audience and they have come up with a few questions and I'm going to uh, request uh, Mark or any of the other facilitators to please respond to them. Question number one is, are we flawed humans capable of equality? <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> you just asked the small question first. Like, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> I, tru I truly believe that we are. Um, I think it is a struggle. Um, it means constant vigilance. Um, it's hard work. It's hard work, but it's worth it. You know, uh, the, the kind of image that Habitat for Humanity creates of a safe haven is what we all want. You know, it's, uh, and, and <laughs> at the really interesting thing about the whole um, education project in school is uh, when we talk to teachers and, uh, and um, education policymakers about what they want 
what what they want to happen in schools. They talk about higher level mathematics and more STEM subjects and so on. When you talk to parents and families and kids, they say they want happiness. They want security. Um, now, supposing we flipped what we're doing in school and we made happiness and security our primary goals and everything else in the curriculum was to serve those ends, then we might have a chance. Thank you. I think our audience is definitely going to take back some takeaways from it. The second question is, how do we get to know about books like When Stars Are Scattered? Is there a website to guide us? I think question is, are there preteen books, you know, which lends itself to debunking some of the prejudices or some of the causes and movements? And where does one look for it? Mm -hmm. um, there are many sites. Uh, the, the easiest and the, and the first one that I want to suggest is read the uh, readers' reviews on sites like Goodreads. Um, maybe go to, if you want, in categories, you can do that. Let's say you were interested in um, books about people struggling with race issues, race mm -hmm. prejudice. All you have to do is key that in, in Goodreads, and you'll find their list of top, top 50 books about race prejudice. Um, or LGBTIQ issues or whatever. And then I would suggest that you go to Amazon because everybody can access that and read the pretty full reviews sometimes. You know, most of those are not fake um, and where they are just reviews in response to a free book, um, that's always stated too. Um, the various uh, journals of librarianship, um, Publishers Weekly in the United States, School Library Journal, um, in the UK, Bookseller, um, and there are various, Achuka and so on. There are websites all over. Um, start one in India. Um, get, get stuff going, you know, because people are hungry for this information and sometimes um, it's a bit scattered. Thank you. Actually, there are. I'm going to put some links on the chat later on. Um, Fantastic. And a final question, because we are running a little there's a little lag. This question is particularly important, I think, for parents. Even if you do not teach binary thinking to our children, society will. What can we as parents do? And I guess how can stories be of help? Wow. Well, I'm not going to do all the talking. <laughs> <laughs> Sachin, what do you think? May I? Yes, yes. Um, we all say that, you know, charity begins at home. So uh, be it, you know, about sensitizing the children, be it, you know, kind of helping them out with the kind of prejudices that they're going to face in the society. So if it begins at home and if we can put these seeds in the children's mind at home, probably they will be you know, equipped to deal with this or to handle the kind of prejudices that come up in the society as they walk in. Yeah, that's what I personally feel that somewhere we need to begin and why not begin it at home then? And, and I, would, I, I, would, yeah. I would add to that, that um, children are very aware of these things. People say, oh, why don't you let them keep their childhood innocence? There isn't childhood innocence. That's an adult invention. Um, children are very aware of grief. They're very aware of loss. They're aware of war and divorce and so on. Our job as adult caregivers is to support them and be there as a kind of safety net when they feel like they're going to fall off whatever their, whatever their position is at the moment. And to encourage that reframing that the Danish authors talk about, you know, to, to look at it differently. Um, my mother... You know, one of the wonderful things, my father, unfortunately, through educational, lack of educational opportunity, my father could never admit that he was wrong about anything. My mother constantly apologized and said, oh, I was wrong about that. I think that's a really big soul who can do that. Um, I, and in fact, the further I go on uh, studying the people who I respect most in writing and in teaching and so on, they're the ones who admit that they don't know. Um, I remember the last day of one of Australia's great educators in uh, pedagogy, he was retiring and I said to him, you know, 
do we know how to make a teacher or are they born? And he said, you know what? We don't know. We don't know. And I thought, what an amazing thing for this guy to say at the end of 50 years of commitment to pedagogy, to be able to say, we're not really sure. Thank you. Thank you, Mark and Sachin. I think uh, that was a very beautiful conclusion that as parents, I think the idea is to admit what we know we don't know, to have dialogue, to have conversations, to use stories, to have multiple narratives, multiple perspectives. Children know how to sift it and figure out how to sort of surmount and get what they want out of it. So now I'm going to quickly um, introduce Deepa, who's going to take our next session. Deepa Soman, um, she's going to take us through the way forward. A little bit about Deepa um, before we begin. She seems to be incredibly accomplished lady, an economics major from St. Xavier's College, Mumbai, with a degree in business management from SPJ Institute of Management and Research. Deepa started her career with Hindustan Lever Limited in sales and marketing research. Deepa, if you uh, is the founder director of Lumiere Business Solutions. Deepa's life and the Lumiere's journey is profiled in Rashmi Bansal's 2013 book, Follow Every Rainbow, on 25 women entrepreneurs. Deepa founded Lumiere to enable women professionals to get back to work. Lumiere works in the areas of customer research, consulting, and design. And Lumiere is taught as a case study at the Harbor, uh, HBR.org and in many other educational institutes as an early adopter of the cloud. Deepa is invited to speak at educational institutes, corporates, chambers of commerce, club and community events on women and work entrepreneurship and consumer centric innovation. She and her husband Milind serve as leadership coaches to professional entrepreneurs, trade bodies, enterprises, startups, and nonprofits. Continuous improvement, design thinking, balanced development, and sustainability are her areas of interest. Deepa is a people collector and connector and is fascinated by the idea of purpose, positive intent, impact multiplication, and the interconnectedness of things. Deepa and Milind work in leading transformation as catalysts and change agents in unlocking the individual team and organizational potential. Deepa's vision is a balanced and conscious humankind that collaborates and connects in building a sustainable and peaceful world. That's Clap, really, Deepa. I think you're doing some amazing work. And over to you now to speak a few words on the way forward for this session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kajol. Mark, thank you for that amazing, amazing session. You know, many of you know Dr. Kumi Vivaina for a very long time. I met her quite by serendipity in November of 2019, when we were both at a friend's wedding in Darjeeling. You know, we had a couple of conversations at the wedding because we were at the same hotel. And somehow one thing led to the other and Kumi talked to me about her ideas about this summit she wanted to hold in the space of transforming education and parenting. And she had me hooked. And Mark, just the way you started your talk by saying, you know, all of us know that we can't change the world. And then we find a Kumi Vivaina who has this vision and pretty much like the Pied Piper, people following the Pied Piper, I was ready to join the bandwagon and jump on to Kumi's train. And Milind and I said, look, all we can do is offer our time, whatever it is we have, Lumiere, our design labs, our office, our space, our network, 
use us as we will as you will and i remember on the 6th of january we had kumi come in and talk to the lumiere uh, team as our lumiere learning monday guest speaker and we then had a brainstorming a visioning exercise for kumi where we invited r sridhar who is a creativity coach and we said you know we want you to facilitate this session our design lab team with there and mind you the covid scene hadn't happened you know we were going to do this at the world trade center kumi knew she had dr firoza godrej who had believed in her idea she had a couple of uh, sponsors like tatas who had said that we'll support you she had speakers like mark and so many others mahera and you know all the wonderful people bitu uh, several people who believed in her and she knew that she had this and of course she had you know uh, donna and she said donna is going to be there and i remember donna yazdi rakhi neha who is helping us with social media we pulled all of us together and we brainstormed we didn't know covid was going to happen we didn't know we were going to do this digitally we had a completely different idea of how this was going to pan out and oh my god after that time to what you've seen today as the penultimate day or the last of the beginning of our journey in this transforming education and parenting piece uh, all milind and i knew is at chain facilitators you know something so big and so magnificent is going to be a seed that we are sowing that's all this has to take life of its own and in all humility i tell you it is just been marvelous every weekend i know i come in i show up uh, sometimes i go on youtube sometimes i sign up from facebook and you know it's like when you see a great movie you read a fascinating book you want everybody in the world to read that book doesn't it happen to all of us and here i am clamoring and saying why aren't more people coming to this you know it's it's you know why aren't more people signing up for the projects why aren't more people wanting to and you know i go there and i sign up for every project and i'm saying am i serious like am i even is this even really going to happen am i going to attend all these training programs and i i kid you not today when mark i i'm going to sign up for all the change facilitator si- training because i just want to learn and i want more people to be a part of this movement that our friend dr Kum- dr kumi vivaina wants to do and mark i want to tell you one more thing i spent 3 years in jamaica our daughter ria was born in kingston in jamaica lumiere was born in jamaica as lumiere consultancy services coincidentally on the 8th of march when even before women's day happened to be formed even and it it's just a coincidence that it happens to be 8th march that the company was first founded as lumiere consultancy services i've been at it next year we complete 25 years of lumiere in india it's a platform for women professionals to get back to work and we've done a lot of work in that space and i'm, I'm uh, you know and and parenting because i must share this with you parenting is the single greatest preserve of the amateur and you know all of us it's not my line it's not my quote but i just love this quote and when rahul was born when our son was born he's 28 uh, today um and our daughter ria 3 years later uh, i felt so much uh, you know uh, not competent and i I'm, i'm sure a lot of us feel that way not competent but we have uh, mothers we have mothers in law and i had you know my mother uh, passed on 2 uh, weeks after her 50th birthday when rahul was 4 months old and my grandmother had passed on 6 months before that so you can imagine how bereft i felt of any guidance as a as you know as a young mother and then we you know we moved away to jamaica just when rahul was 5 months old and uh what comes closest to parenting to my mind is gardening and of course my lessons growing up as a child and every time i've been stumped on what to do i think of what is it that i would do as a gardener and believe you me that's held me in good stead a friend of mine 
uh, who does a good job with cacti tells me benign neglect is what works best with cacti. And a lot of times that's been my parenting mantra as well, benign neglect. And I, I can tell you today as a, a mother of a, a lawyer and a mother of a industrial designer, uh, we didn't do too badly. But we had one thing that Melinda and I knew as our parenting goal, which is to raise happy kids. It was a simple goal. We'll raise happy kids, no matter what. When we were dating and when we decided to come together to get married, I said, I have one thing that I ask of you, that if we have any differences or we have serious disagreements, we will not have those in front of the children. And I'm very happy to tell you it's going to be whatever, 28 years of being parents, we've kept that promise that we made to ourselves. And I think we today when I, as mommy coach, I've seen increasingly mothers, parents be very, very anxious, very, very anxious. And all I, I, all I can say is that we transmit that anxiety, our uncertainty, our, uh, you know, our fears into our, our ch child rearing. And if we can only take a step back, we brought in nature in a huge way in our parenting. We have a group in Navi Mumbai called the Namunas, uh, Nam Navi Mumbai Naturalists. And every Sunday we took our kids to nature trails. Every Sunday, and, and you know, we didn't know the imp impact of all this was that was happening on our kids. But now as, as grown people, when we sit down and we, we converse and they talk about some of the things that we did as amateurs, I think maybe we didn't do all that bad, you know? And I would urge uh, all of us are here because of Kumi, and I know this is the beginning, but all I can say is that uh, we must do this year on year on year because, you know, the tipping point of change that Kumi talks about in her beautiful TED talk is, is all about that whatever number of monkey. And I want to be the monkey that's been making some changes. And I want all of us to be those monkeys making changes, be it in education or in parenting. And if we can all come together, uh, I think in our lifetime, uh, we might be able to see uh, some changes in building a kinder world and a kinder community. If we can all promise that we can sign up, get trained, oh my God. I mean, every one of these sessions, uh, you know, I'm an intrepid note taker. I have reams and reams of notes from all the speakers' uh, sessions. And Mark, oh my God, what a session you've given us today. Thank you again for that. Uh, a change facilitators, so much respect for all of you putting aside time uh, to come and participate and do this. And all I can say to uh, the professors, the teachers, the educators, the parents who are here, uh, spread the word. Let's create a lot of uh, energy, uh, even if we can tell five people in our community and our networks to be a part of this so that, you know, today we are here for Kumi, but tomorrow let's come here for ourselves, for our children. Let's come here for, uh, you know, all of those things that we believe in. Because let me tell you, there is Pied Piper Kumi today, but let's all be a part of creating this movement. Kumi, as Donna rightly said, has given a, you know, so much energy, so much uh, and, and, and really, uh, let me tell you this, I have witnessed to the anxiety uh, in, at close quarters about things, you know, uh, the, the, it, it's really like a ringside view I've had to the unfolding over the past one year of making this uh, program. And I think from what we could have achieved at World Trade Center to what we've accomplished and just taking this online to folks in Australia who are watching, I think it must be what, 10.30 uh, uh, night your time and you're up 
being part of this. I mean, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for this. And I have been lucky. I'm glad we met at that wedding, at Irshad's daughter's wedding, Kumi. And I'm so privileged, our team, and I speak on behalf of all at Lumiere uh, to be a part of this. And as change, uh, you know, folks who work in the space of change, uh, it's all about a program. It's all about having a project. It's all about meeting at timely intervals of having agendas, of having your stand-ups, of tracking, keeping track of, you know, how the project is moving forward, of logging, of maintaining records, of having a communication piece. And we plan to be there. Melinda and I plan to uh, jump into a couple of these to make interventions, of course, with Komi's permission, uh, so that we can move and push the projects forward. Because I think we owe that to our Pied Piper. Yazdi, uh, Glenn, Donna, uh, Milind, Neha, uh, Rakhi, uh, everybody who's sort of come together. Uh, and of course, over the year, thank you, ma'am, uh, Firoza Godrej, for your trust, because I think Kumi got her first sense of confidence when you said yes to her. And I remember how she was feeling that day. So thank you very much for that. Uh, so Kumi, we are with you uh, in, in whatever way. Use us, like I said. I, I said that to you the first day, and I say that again and again. So thank you for being you. Thank you, Deepa. I think you're going to make me cry. My, I, I feel a lot of moistness around my eyes. But genuinely, as I said earlier, this is such a huge project. I'm very, very ambitious. When I started out, I didn't even think it would take off the way it did. We had 3,000 participants at the education and three, over 3,000 at the parenting. So it's just amazing. But don't make me the pipe piper. I'm not going to lead you to destruction. <laughs> So let's walk together, hand in hand. Let's just walk together and re help reach the tipping point because I don't know, you may say that I have the naivete of a child, but I always, always am optimistic, come what may. And I feel that if we go on talking about change, we really need to be the change. And let's not be critical about everything. Okay, fine, be critical, but then come up with a solution. That's my belief. So this is the first JTPS summit and it's drawn to a close. And uh, I think this was quite a grand finale, if I may. Thank you very, very much, Mark, and all your change facilitators, Ruth, Sachin, Gauri, Rohit. You have put in a lot of work. Thank you very much. Thanks, Deepa, for the extremely wonderful address at the concluding session. Thank you, Kajol, for having so expertly managed the entire session. A thank you to all the participants. As I said earlier, this is the first Global Tipping Point Summit. We want to make it an annual event. Several of you have written to us that could GTPS arrange for workshops and regular lectures. We will try for them, but keep in touch with us and look at our website as often as you possibly can. We hope that where we get, get your full cooperation, even for this action project, Mark's action project is huge. It is encouraging you to come up with your own narratives. And many of us have this sense of trepidation. How will we write? I'm not a writer. Mark and his team are going to guide you to talk about yourself. And if you do not want to use your name, your real name, you could use your pseudonym. That's fine. That's absolutely fine. But you will have your stories out in the world. And in that way, you will be contributing to exchange. So, it's been a wonderful journey. It's been a fun-filled journey. There have been highs and lows, but I don't think there have been any, any serious disagreements among any of us. Am I right? Deepa, Donna, all of you, never. We've just been, okay, it's not working this way. Let's try some other way. 
and thank you for walking hand in hand with me. All right. <laughs> so we hope to see you all at the next GTPS summit. But before that, if I can manage to honor you, I would like to honor your suggestion, of course, and try arranging for workshops and uh, talks. If we can do it, we will. So keep looking at our website. You have all these numerous projects that you can sign up for up to the 7th of February. We began with codependency with Father Joe Pereira. Then we had Bittu Seigel's creative training for sustainability. Uh, parent school partnership of, uh, sorry, that was Suzanne. Uh, Bittu was parenting for a better planet for our kids, hugely important. I'm going to sign up for that. Creative thinking for sustainability with Suzanne and her team. Parent school partnership with Varsha and her team. Then uh, it's screen free Sunday. This is something very exciting. And Jim is a great leader and speaker. So he is doing some very exciting work and perhaps you should sign up for this screen free Sunday. Conscious parenting, brilliant session, brilliant ideas. Shraddalu Ranade, the scars of shaming. We heard Mahera and her team speak ever so eloquently and a hugely important topic once again, since all of us have experienced shaming at some time in our lives or the other, and Mark's present project, How to Get Home. So please, please be a part of the action group and realize that if you have missed any of the sessions, as I said earlier, everything is in the past events section of our website and the Google Forms will be open up to 7th of February. Um, after 7th of February, we will create groups and your change facilitators and speakers will start working with you. So for like, follow and share us on our social media handles and let's work together to be the change. Thank you very much. Stay happy. Stay safe. God bless. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs> bye. Thank you. Thank you, Kumi. Thank you.